Now, uh, celebrations of New Year in the Bible uh, were very important occasions. Uh, let's read some scriptures on the, uh, the importance of celebrating uh, new beginnings or, or new timings in the Lord. You notice that uh, in the book of Exodus, <coughs> when the Israelites uh, were ready to come forth, God spoke to them of the Passover in Exodus chapter 13. <coughs> Exodus chapter 13. Uh, tonight we're going to have uh, uh, free time for you to give your testimonies and uh, also to be able to uh, lead a prayer if you like or share in what way the Lord uh, has guided you. It's a, it's a night on New Year's Eve for Thanksgiving. <coughs> Thanksgiving for all that the Lord has done and also a time of fasting and prayer as you enter into the New Year. <coughs> So you read your Bible in the book of Exodus chapter 13, and God tells them, as they prepare for the last and ten plague, God says in verse uh, 3 onwards, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No living bread shall be eaten. <clears throat> on this day you're going out in the month of Abib so the Lord even know exactly to the civil calendar what day it is and says it shall be when the Lord brings into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hevites and the Jebusites which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey you shall keep this service in this month seven days you shall eat unleavened bread and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. And living bread shall be eaten seven days, and no living bread shall be seen among you, nor shall living be seen among you in all your quarters. And you shall tell your son in that day, saying, This is done because of what the Lord did for me when I came from Egypt. It shall be a sign to you on your hand as a memorial. <coughs> Between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. <clears throat> so it tells us here that as the Lord prepared them for the ten plague, the Lord also at the same time institute the beginning of something to remind them, a memorial, he tells them here. When you look at the year that has passed by, passed, what do you get out of the year? Is it more money, more power, more strength, more health? Well, in the end, all these things do pass away. We thank God for more blessings. We thank God for divine help. We thank God for renewing our youth like the eagle. We thank God for all these things. But all these things are relative to what we lost in the Garden of Eden. In heaven, you never think about health because there is no sickness. Healthy is the norm. Divine life is the norm. In heaven, there is no poverty. So, prosperity is the norm. Everyone has as much as they want, as they desire in God, and as they are capable, and as God deems uh, their level able to contain it, everyone has a blessing from God. Your mansions in heaven do not need title deeds, you do not need to buy and sell, because they are freely given by God. So all that you think about on this earth is only relative to the fall of Adam and Eve. So we think about the year that has gone by, whether we have more, more wealth, more blessings, more health. All this is in terms of what we lost. We need to think better than to think early thoughts. That's the early perspective of the year that has gone by. What's the heavenly perspective? 
if there was no poverty, if there was no sickness, if there was no need, if everything you had has always been there, what do you take out of this year? After all, in Christ, all your needs are actually met, whether they be spirit, soul, and body. We are supposed to start tasting of the fruits before the fall. And even though you might not see all restoration of all things yet, potentially, it is in the process. For things happen in this life slower than they happen in the spiritual dimension. But what shall we take of this year? Memories. Memories. It's the experience of this year that has gone by. And we pray that out of this year, you take memories of experiences of love. Memories of experiences of joy. Memories, as we have sung just now, of experiences of happiness and of peace. Memories are why we came to this ultimate. And no doubt this year might not have been as perfect a year as some of you have desired. And think about what you were like when you were anticipating this new year. And think about comparing your anticipation with how this year has passed by. And you will definitely agree on one thing. Things never always work out the way you plan. Things might work out better. Things might not seem to be better. But you can thank God that in the Lord, they will always be better. You might not see the end of the tunnel yet, even for some of you this year. Some of you, you might see the end of the tunnel and the light coming. But it's important for us to celebrate at the end of this year with seeking the Lord, which the Lord command them and says that they are supposed to celebrate and institute this year. Now in Exodus chapter 12, as the Lord released them and described and says this is the man of Abib for them, the Lord tells them in chapter 12 verse 1, He spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, This man, He says, shall be your beginning of months, it shall be the first month of the year to you. So to the Lord, He changed their whole perspective of the calendar and told them that, look, I'm going to rearrange your calendar so that the Passover is your new year. Not your normal new year, which is uh, three months ago. But it says your Passover is your new year. And this will be where you celebrate your new year because that is where you actually begin something that the Lord has for you. We humans measure our years by different calendars. In the early days of the Petra and the Old Testament, they measured the year probably by the lifespan of the oldest person and like Adam onwards. In the time of Noah, as the world began all over again, they measured the year by the year of Noah, how old he was. And that was the measurement sometimes before calendars were invented uh, of civilizations long ago, by the year that the king reigned. And, uh, and the king, king lived or the king died and it was measured by those things. Until our modern civilization, they invented a new year. But then we realize that every culture has their own new year and the measurements of the new year. As you know, the Chinese one is the next month. The Jewish one is in uh, September, October. And uh, then uh, different, different civilizations have different new year. And some, sometimes the new year seems magical to us. But it seems magical to us by our own, our own creation. You could have, for example, have a shorter year or longer year. It's our own creation. But there's some things that doesn't change. The earth does go around the sun in 365 and a quarter days. And uh, the seasons, you can never change them because they are based on the season or the rotation of the earth around the sun. However, we measure years. So we realize that uh, sometimes um, uh, you have like almost a magical year. Like this year you have um, the 11 of the 11 of 2011. So the people is magical. Uh, look at it, I say, hey, it's created by humans. It's our measuring system. 
If you measure it by the Hebrew calendar, that's not a magical day. If you measure it by Chinese calendar, it might not be anything special. Uh, and so it's our own creation and our own belief system. The Chinese, of course, think that next year, this year is rabbit, next year is dragon. And there are all the 12 animals that are there. And uh, some other uh, cultures, they might measure the year by the different stars that shine. Uh, how does the new year affect us or do we affect the new year? And some people might say, hey, they seem to be affected. Like people who follow some astrology and they say they were born under what star, what star, and uh, of the 12 different uh, uh, pictures of uh, astrology, uh, whether they be a uh, Gemini or the Virgo, or they be Scorpio, Scorpion or whatever, and they say, hey, it seems to affect their life. And uh, some people say, well, you're born, you know, and a lot of Chinese want to get ready to be born in, and uh, give birth in the year of the dragon. And uh, so when my wife and I were talking about it, I say, hey, I wonder what year Jesus was born in. <laughs> and uh, what is 4 BC or to 5 BC or 6 BC, roughly the year that Jesus was born. And uh, check on some of it. I don't know whether you calculate correctly, but I looked at some internet site, and it seems to be the year of the pig. I was hoping it would be the year of the sheep. And they just nudged the lamb on the ship. But Jesus was not following the, the Chinese calendar, of course. And, uh, but sometimes people say, hey, they see the patterns. And you know why? You are affected by what you believe. If you believe that being born in the year of the rat makes you a rat, being born in the year of the dragon makes you powerful and a king, then it might help you. Because your faith is in that. But if you believe that, you know, whether that year makes a difference or not, uh, doesn't happen to you, then it doesn't happen to you. But sometimes, belief system is subconscious. You say with your mouth you don't believe, but in your heart you do believe. You subconsciously fear. Fear is a reverse form of faith. You still believe, except you believe in a negative side. So you still believe the system and it affects you. And so some people, they say, well, they're born under this star, or under that star, or this astrological sign. And um, when they believe that, it affects them. You are affected by what you believe. In the same way as um, some people who believe, uh, I think in the J Japan and some other countries, they believe your blood group makes you different type of people. And perhaps your A or AB or your O and even blood will give you a certain personality. Even such simple things, you believe it, it affects you. So the whole basis is our belief system, our personal belief system, our inherited belief system. Now, inherited subconscious belief system affects us more than you think. And the Bible wants to clear all these things out when God says, God says to the Hebrews, because the Hebrew calendar at that time was very affected by the Egyptian mentality. And to, ex to a certain extent, they've been celebrating the civil year from wherever the calendar was invented. God was telling them, after going through over 430 years after Abraham, and after whole generations of being slaves, and you're measuring some things by their calendar. God wants to wipe out all their cultural belief system that was infected by Egyptian pollution and Egyptian things and worldly things that are not in line with God. God wants to get rid of all those things. So as we enter into the new year, in your mind, if you're a Chinese, you must not believe that just because this dragon is better than the year of the rabbit. And you must not believe that, you know, uh, whatever you're born in. So, my wife asked me, what am I born in? I'm chicken. <laughs> no, she's a rooster, right? And anyway, and, uh, so, but it's just for the fun of it that we disturb. But I don't believe in those things. They should affect our personality or, or who we are in any way. And all these things, as we enter the new year, all our belief system, all our inherited cultural system. Now, all culture has some good. 
Eh, we're not throwing the baby out with the bath water. Uh, all culture has some good, all things have some good in them. But wherever they affect things like who you are, what you can do, your personality, these things should have no basis in your life. They must be washed out. Keep the baby, throw the bath water out. The only things good in every culture are those things that draw you nearer to God. Those things have, uh, that has a neutral value, that give you like a certain sense of fashion that you might enjoy, or taste, or cultures that, are, that differentiates the different varieties, like nice to taste something salty once in a while, nice to taste something sweet once in a while, nice to even taste something bitter once in a while. And uh, all those things are good. And, um, uh, which reminds me, I forgot to give uh, Eddie and some of you who, who visited in Canberra the most bitter tea that I've ever tasted. I reminded myself to do it and I forgot. Uh, it's so bitter, you might find it here. I found it in Canberra in uh, one of the Chinese shops. It's uh, 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 a roll-up leaf. I don't know what leaf it is. And it's a long, narrow little thing. But it's a whole leaf roll-up. And it looks like a tiny little tube. You put three of those in hot water, leave it for one hour, it's the most bitter thing you ever tasted. More bitter than the Chinese medicine bitter that I've tasted. More bitter than bitter corn. And, uh, but, here's the thing. When I test it in everyone, after you drink the bitter tea, the really bitter tea, and your whole mouth is filled with bitterness for a few minutes, you drink plain water, plain water tastes sweet. I don't know what it does to the sense system, but after tasting that tea, all your sen in internal senses might come out and the only thing can taste everything very sweet. And, uh, but that tells something about life. For some of you this year, you have cried some tears. You have felt some bitterness. And we say, what is this year like to you? Some of you might say, well, bitter. Some might say, salty. Well, I don't know what salty year is like. <laughs> salty year could mean you eat too much preservatives, too much junk food. Or you say, what year is it? And you say, oh, it's been a sweet year, lovey-dovey year. Right. Or what kind of year has it been? Uh, remember, we came to earth to taste all these things. We came to taste the bitter with the sweet. We came to taste the salty with the sour. We came to taste all these fascinating tastes that, that God has given within us. And if your life has some tears, some sadness, some happiness throughout this year, one thing you must do tonight. Don't bring a single one of your bitterness into tomorrow. Hear the dumb ropes? <laughs> okay. Do not bring a single one of your bitter taste into tomorrow. Let it produce whatever knowledge you need, whatever learning experience you need. And like tasting the bitter tea, you can now have the greater capacity to taste some sweetness. Sweetness. Water tastes sweet after you taste something super bitter. And uh, maybe my next trip, that will be just at the end of February, maybe you all can eat all over again. Bring the bitter tea. Hallelujah. And uh, <clears throat> so then we might put it out there and say, anyone who has experienced bitter tea, there you go for it. And uh, by the way, during the 40 day fast, which starts tomorrow by the way, uh, Eddie is going to open a broccoli shop. <laughs> that sells broccoli juice. Anyway. Um, so we have all these tastes that are there, but it, whatever you have experienced this year, do not bring your sadness into tomorrow. It was man for that season, that time. Whatever failures or mistakes you have made, don't bring it to the next year. That's what this meeting is for tonight. Some people say, why 31st? Why not do 30th and then 31st we go and enjoy? Because it happened to be a calendar time where we can mark some demarcations like the new beginning. And God marks 
our spiritual calendar by events. What calendar do you use in heaven? None. How do you measure time? One of the things you don't have in heaven are watches. You go to your mansion in heaven, no clocks, no calendar. So you could be praying and then you, since you don't need to eat, you, you never ate. And you could be praying and since there's no clock, you don't know what's the time. And since the sun doesn't rise or set, and you're not affected, all is by the light of God, and you're praying, and then when you pray for this, you come up, wow, that was a hundred years. <laughs> so how do you measure events in God? How do you measure things? We must measure it by events. And here's the important thing. We must also thank God for the bitter things you taste in this year. That's why we call this Thanksgiving. And we also call it a time of fasting because fasting is in the background. And the background is that we come with humbling ourselves in repentance, of course. For any things that we should have done this year that we didn't do, may God have mercy on us and we'll be able to have grace to still do it. But whatever things or mistakes we have made this year, do not bring it to the next year. This year, which ends tonight, let it not only be forgiven, let it be forgotten, erased out of your conscious memory. And if you try to recall it from time to time, recall it as something already surrendered to God. Let no bitterness or root of bitterness grow in your life, but only take with you thanksgiving. And so if you have things to repent of, quickly repent. you got exactly about three hours left. And, but of course, repentance doesn't have to take three hours. Who says repentance is measured by hours or days? I know there are people who repented for days and hours, but that's not really repentance alone. Intercession. They repent and then they intercede that God will turn things around. How fast does it take God to forgive? As fast as a twinkling of an eye. As fast as a twinkling of an eye. It's done. That's it. God, God doesn't look at sin or failures the same way we look at. He doesn't look at it the same way. If you want how God looks at it, it's something like how a, pa a parent look at a little child who is trying to walk. So when your little child tries to walk, for the first time, remember how excited parents are. Some of you haven't been parents. We're going to, you know, try to share our experience with you. When your child first stand up, some of you, all the time, child always crawling. On all fours. And so as they're crawling, the first time they stand up, everybody say, hey, 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 can stand. Oh, you could be holding on to something. And then the next one, they started walking. Hey, 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 they start walking. And then, but once in a while, they still stumble and fall. When your child stumble and fall, do you take the child, punish the child for 40 days and 40 nights, scar the child, bruise the child, you know, kick the child, you know, and say, I'll never forgive you for falling. <laughs> never. No such thing in God. And how many sins can you commit in a year that God will forgive? Anybody remember that? The disciples asked that of Jesus. 70 times 7. Uh, at first, it uh, they, uh, at first, it, it was asking seven times. No good suggestion. Seven times. Jesus says, 70 times seven. And then you say, Whoa, 70 times seven. Well, that's a lot. But it doesn't cover every day. 70 times seven per day. <laughs> wow! Remember, all the things that you have not succeeded, the secret of longevity in a human life, is to be able to look back and say these words. Thank you for those times. Thank you for those times. Thank you for the bitter time. Thank you for the sad times. Thank you. If you cannot give thanks to God, you, you still got unforgiveness. That's why tonight is a night of thanksgiving. If tonight there's any event in your memory, anything in your life that you say, I just cannot give thanks. You have unforgiveness. 
So the message for you tonight is the one with John the Baptist dressed in camel's hair, looking there like a wild man saying, Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand! Right, that's for you. Um, that is uh, to get us out of the situation. But if you cannot look at something with thanksgiving, it is either you cannot forgive others, and that is easy, you forgive others because of the love of God. Or you cannot forgive yourself. So you're punishing yourself. Is it, I, 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 why should I do that again? And you make those mistakes and you cannot forgive yourself. Then you will forever drag that like a dead albatross around your neck. Because you all don't know what an albatross looks like. So, you know, it's like a dead pig around your neck. Right? No, no, stinking dead pig filled with thousand year old eggs. That has been rotting in the Singapore sun for a few days. So, it's like dragging that into your new year. None of us want to do that. We want to be able to say, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in everything. Thank you, Lord. And if you cannot give thanks to God, there's one more area. You go unforgiveness against God. Say, whoa, who can have unforgiveness against God? A lot of people. Why? They are angry at God. Anger at God is equal to unforgiveness to God. But God can take it. I mean, He's God. And, uh, and, you, get, and you might say, oh, you know, God, why, why, why do all these things happen? And then you're angry at God. You're angry at yourself, angry at God, angry at people, angry at everyone. Then you bring your anger into the next new year. So next new year, next, next new year, you really become the angry dragon. So that wouldn't be what the Lord wants. You're supposed to be a sheep, not a dragon. And uh, it's important for us to be able to give thanks. Thank God for the bitter. Thank God for the salty. Thank God for the sad times. Thank God for the bad times. And of course, thank God for the good times. And that's another thing. A lot of good things have happened to people and they never say thank you to the Lord. Never. When the bad times come, they complain. Good things happen. They say, wow, I'm a self-made man. They forgot that it's God and the grace of God. No person is a self-made person. It's the grace of God that helps them and give them the opportunity. Of course, everyone is responsible to do whatever best they need to do. But no matter how wise, how clever you could have been, you got it because of the grace of God. All our wisdom, all our, our, our power and ability would not have given us the opportunity. And everything that you've been blessed with, someone, somewhere, someplace, who could be smarter, more dedicated than you, did not get it. Because in spite of all their dedication, they didn't have the grace of God smiling on their lives, or the opportunity. So the good times, we also must give thanks to God. And be able to say at the end of tonight, Thank you, Lord from the depths of your heart to be able to say thank you Lord and you enter into the new year with thanksgiving thanksgiving that in our own human way we're measuring our life year by year so that when you enter in the Lord specially want you to enter the new year with celebration celebration and it's a mixture of fasting and celebration in the Bible. The most important time in, the, in, their, in their Hebrew calendar was a fasting time and also a feasting time. It was a real mixture. In, a, in the book of um, Numbers chapter 10, God told them to make two silver trumpets. In Numbers chapter 10, the Lord said to Moses in verse 1 and verse 2, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation, for directing the movement of the camps. 
and he told them how they had to blow them and, and when they had to blow them. And, uh, and then in verse 10, these are the other users of the trumpet. Also in the day of your gladness, in your appointed feasts and the beginning of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your burnt offerings, over the sacrifices of your peace offering. They shall be a memorial for you before your God. I am the Lord your God. <coughs> so you heard of the English phrase, don't blow your trumpet. Alright, there's <laughs> anymore talking about boasting. Here God was telling them literally, blow your trumpets. And uh, blow the silver trumpet because God wants them to enter. And, and what beginning was that? Not just once a year. God says, at your appointed feast, when it's feast time, blow the trumpet. At the beginning of your month, so 12 times a year, blow the trumpet on the first of every month. And then you shall blow the trumpet over your burnt offering. So how often do they offer burnt offering? Every day, twice a day. And over the sacrifice of your peace offering, how often is that? As often as the people uh, uh, come and brought a peace offering, which is a free will offering. And that could be quite, quite often, especially if you've got one temple and it's for the whole nation. So almost every day, I mean, all the time the trumpeters will break. And then they think, wow, got one more. And you can imagine, they got a lot of trumpeters, not like a few that we have here in the church, you know. Imagine, some of you were excited. Wait until you had to blow every second. <laughs> Thank God, they had 120 trumpeters in the book of Second Chronicles when they dedicate uh, Second Chronicles chapter 5 when they were dedicating the temple. Can you imagine? I, I have never been to any, even any mega church. I have never seen any church with a big choir where you got 120 trumpeters. Now I can add that to my dream. One day, Lord, we shall have a choir with 120 trumpeters. But to have 120 trumpeters, you better have a lot of other musicians. Because you'll be drowned out. There's 120 of them blowing. I mean, when one of you guys here are blowing, you know, it's either Gloria or James, right? You're blowing those two things. Always it's a Gloria blowing. And once in a while, I think some of you know how to blow too. And uh, can you imagine when you blow that thing, every musical instrument cannot be heard. Right? <laughs> Imagine 120 of you! Wow! The guitar will just sound like a whisper in the wind. So to have 120 trumpeters, you probably have uh, 20 pianists and you have a whole orchestra and all, all those things going and you got a lot of human voices singing. Then the 120, I mean, they're just a timbre in, in, uh, in the sea of music. And uh, so that will be an interesting uh, enough goal, right? Uh, 120 trumpeters, and you know how skillful a trumpeter can be like. You know, one of them, uh, an American, he looks exactly almost like our our team, Phil Driscoll. I mean, he has his small little trumpet, and when he blows, you could feel the anointing coming. He's an anointed trumpeter, and here the Lord says, every time something begins, blow the trumpet, blow the trumpet, blow the trumpet. Wow, you can imagine that the Lord want them to welcome the new year, the new beginning, with excitement. Because you don't normally use the, the trumpets. Here, the trumpets are not used for funeral. I know that in our modern day today, trumpets are used for war. Here they are used for war, used for calling the people. And in our modern day, you know, they are trumpets. But the trumpet sound for funeral is different. Da, 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 da. Almost like the trumpet is dying. And uh, such a dying tone. Nobody could go to battle with that kind of sound. You know, imagine the Allies about to invade uh, Germany and they say, you know, Emmons! Somebody has sound! And everybody with the guns gear, the machine guns already, and the cannon already, or what the, what the new thing should have already been marched, and the somebody has gone, he's still going, ta 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 they go, ah, ta ta shoot the somebody again, right? Anyway, what we need, as we enter the new year, none of the trumpets are for sad moments. Because God wants us to enter the new year. Hey, Pastor David sends it today. He wants us to dance. 
But too bad at the time when he asked you all to dance, I was already in the spirit. <laughs> and I just enjoy whatever the law was showing. And, but the, the, the mood is there, is to enter into the new year with happiness in your heart. Of course, all of us express our happiness differently. So it's never compulsory for anyone to dance. You know, it's all right. You know, even if 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 uh, you're being scolded, dance, dance, dance. You also don't have to dance because COG, right? You dance as a spirit lead. But the scolding is just to motivate you. Just like in Indonesia, they have this is a uh, zebra crossing. So, but the zebra crossing is not really for crossing, because if you cross, no car stops for you. <laughs> say, then I say, how do you use the zebra crossing? Oh, you know, you got to raise your hands, signal, and then say cross. Because no car obeys the zebra crossing. Even red light can also go. So don't talk about zebra crossing. So what is that for? That's just to keep you awake. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then not only that, they're always honing all the time. I was in Indonesia, and they're honing all the time. I was in this car, and then I had a watch, and I was putting my hand out and say, Hey, put your hand in. Say, why do they take your hand? <laughs> for the watch, it, wow, Ooh, thank you very much. Anyway, I said no. And, uh, and, then, and then, then it's horny all the time. So I say, you know, the, and then the people also didn't care. The people simply walk all over the place. So nobody you know, seems to obey the rules and they're, they're horny all the time. And then I say, you horn so much that the horn got no more meaning. Right? Normally when you horn is it's for something, yeah, it's either you know, you're blocking someone or you're, you're supposed to obey or there's danger, then you horn. And you horn. And, uh, but you're horning all the time, you see, what's the purpose of the horn? So the driver say, oh, keep everybody away. <laughs> oh, 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 no way. Well, thank God that all these sounds and the trumpets are making all those things is to help us enter the joy of the Lord. This joy that we have. And you can only have pure joy. And you can express your joy in your own way. Remember, some of you might be so quiet. So I wrote, When the Spirit of the Lord moves within my heart, I will dance, a day we dance. Are you really singing and meaning the song? Yes, my heart dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so, you could dance in your own way, you could weep, you could cry, whatever. But it's important that deep within us, that this new year, you enter in free of any guilt, free of any burden. It's like you were born again. Of course, we should not use that phrase because the theologians will come after us. Well, you mean every year you get born again? <laughs> right, no such thing. Uh, theologically not sound. But in the sense of being able to enter the new year, cleanse, fresh. You know, how some of you would desire, oh, how nice if I enter the new year fresh. Like I've never done anything wrong in my life and everything all in front of me. You can do that every year. The skill is to combine the end of the year preparation with a 40 day fast. <laughs> you enter it, ah, and you're just humbling yourself before the Lord. Say, what's the fasting for? You know, fasting doesn't, doesn't change God, but fasting prepares you to receive everything that the Lord wants you for the next year. And uh, so I'm excitedly looking to the fast. Some people say, wow, 40 day fast coming. Uh. Oh. And then even though you're celebrating your Christmas, you're celebrating with you know, uh, what you would call um, uh, sort of some anxiety. Then, wow, fast coming, uh, fast coming, eat more, fast coming, <laughs> eat more. No, it should not be that way, but even as you're ready for the new year, you end the, wow, the fast is coming, blow the trumpet. Ta, 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 ta. Didn't it say in the book of Job, blow the trumpet, consecrate a fast? Because it's an exciting time that. Great things are coming forth. Plus, this is the year. Oops, okay, we have the Yahweh fly over my the prayer box there. And underneath, well, this is alright. <laughs> but the prayer box, we are cleaning it all out. So, some of you say, 
Ah, my prayer request, no answer yet. Yes, of course, it's, it's already up there. Right? This one is symbolic. We already paid through for one year. So if it's not answered, don't worry. The answers are still on the way. Remember, this earth, time travels slowly. Right? And, um, and so, and even though you experience time, it's something quite interesting in that movie, Inception. Right? As they go different levels into their dream, the deeper and deeper level, uh, time is moving normally, but actually out here, it's just still one second. And uh, so, as in this earth, even though something is answered by God, on our earth, things are very slow. And uh, time, uh, the answers are there. So don't worry, we're going to clean up this box. And uh, of course, you can put new requests in. And, uh, but we especially are asking that, uh, that you bring a photograph. You know? uh, or print out a simple photo. It need not be super clear, whatever, something you can afford, you can put inside. That we can put in uh, to pray for every church member by photo. And you can also put on your new prayer request for the new year, things that you have, or things that stay in your heart and your mind. And uh, that we will discuss uh, this coming Friday, uh, where we have the first all-night prayer for the year. But we're also cleaning out this box tonight. Which means that tomorrow on the first of the year, you look inside. Wow, empty box. Angel came, took everything out. No, not angel. One of us. <laughs> we clean out the whole, whole box. But in a sense, all your prayers are ready with God. So that's, that's what we've been prayed through. And we start forth for the new year. So remember, let's enter into this new year with thanksgiving.